all over the place here. In hypervolemia, I'm jumping ahead of myself, but in hypervolemia, it's essentially the same mechanism as hypovolemia in that there's there's a increased fluid, but it's not in the vessels. The fluid is not in the vessels, and so um, renal angiotensin aldosterone system is is uh, activated. Renal perfusion is decreased. In essence, your body sees a hypovolemic state. All right, and uh, so again, that overrides the uh, osmolarity mechanism, and so this decreased volume causes an increase in ADH. So to go back here, once we've ruled those out, here we go, here we go, um, we have a hyponatremia, hypoosmolar uh, hypo hyponatremia, a true hyponatremia, we've ruled out edematous state, thyroid and adrenal disease, so hypothyroidism, hypocortisolism, and we have urine sodium greater than 20, we have syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. All right. Now, what causes SIADH? Well, I break it into five different categories here. All right. So now, now you should recognize this. This is a beautiful drawing of your lungs. All right. So any lung pathology. This is you recognize the brain. Any brain pathology. Now, this is the kidney. You recognize the kidney, right? He's saying he made me do it. All right. So the kidney is blaming the inappropriate excretion of antidiuretic hormone on the fact that it is inappropriately concentrating the urine. All right. Um, now, any CNS path and any lung path. Why should this be the case? Well, it comes back up here. I know you love this picture, right? So I keep coming back to it. Um, and to the fact that, remember I talked about these baroreceptors kind of being everywhere, but they're concentrated in the lungs and in the brain alright and so stim these baroreceptors are stimulated by lung and brain pathology resulting in inappropriate secretion of antidiuretic hormone now the other mechanisms cancer alright lung cancer, breast cancer, kidney cancer illegible cancer, and pancreatic cancer, and various other types of cancer um, can result in either the tumor secreting antidiuretic hormone or a perineoplastic effect, a perineoplastic effect um, or uh, basically from the tumor itself or from metastases to the brain, okay, other mechanisms, all of these tumors can result in inappropriate anti-ADH, pretty much any kind of cancer, but I think of lung uh, and what type of lung cancer would that be? Uh, normally small cell, right? Um, oops, other, no, wastebasket, right? Okay, so lung, CNS, cancer, and drugs. Now, so anti-cancer drugs. So you're seeing there's a lot of reasons for someone with cancer to have uh, hyponatremia here. Cyclophosphamide, um, I don't even know what that says, vincristin, right? And then... Uh, these ones are big culprits I see all the time, antipsychotics and antidepressants. Any, alright? Any. Um, opioids, and then uh, a few other ones, carbamazepines, NSAID, carbamazepine, NSAIDs, amiodarone, somatostatin, and oxytocin. Oxytocin, I think, is kind of an interesting one. Um, so if I, you know, I hate laundry lists, and I apologize for this. If I were going to remember one thing it would be this okay any pretty much any psych med and any opioid right and then the other ones can be just gravy NSAIDs I think NSAIDs is kind of interesting too but I mean everybody's on NSAIDs and not everybody has hyponatremia so I don't know actually I'm gonna unstart that I don't know how significant that is um, amiodarone everybody's on amiodarone too so uh, that could be uh, one term ever two, but definitely remember psych meds, all right. And uh, so maybe that comes back to this. I don't know. Uh, the The reasons why these drugs cause hyponatremia is I don't think well understood, um, at least not by me. So and then we have this kind of other wastebasket category, but I think of it as the physiologic category. So um, in pregnancy, uh, hypokalemia, and then. Uh, HIV, AIDS, um, 
these are uh, these are all effects, uh, all conditions where you can have inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. Uh, AIDS is sort of a complicated. I mean, it could be maybe they have toxoplasma encephalitis, right? Most common cause of encephalitis. That goes back to this. Maybe they have PCP pneumonia. Maybe they have cryptococcal meningitis, most common cause of meningitis in HIV patient. Uh, with CD4 count less than 200. So, um, I mean, they've got lots of complications, and then just the HIV infection itself can sometimes cause inappropriate ADH. Um, pregnancy, we mentioned, also has the reset osmostat, all right, and then oxytocin. So those are some reasons why pregnancy. I'm, I'm not sure about the hypokalemia. Um, and then sympathetic, so things that increase sympathetic drive. Now, why would that be? If you come to this, I know I hate laundry lists, and now I'm just giving you two of them in a row, but other things that can cause secretion of antidiuretic hormone, you'll see pain, all right? Nausea, hypoglycemia, nicotine. What do these all have in common? Antiotensin too, all right? These are all sympathetic, uh, sympathetic situ situations in which you're stimulating sympathetic system, all right? And then psych drugs, opiates, antineoplastic drugs. That is saying the same thing as this. All right, let's just review from here. Um, but so anything that causes sympathetic nervous system activation, uh, and that makes sense, right? Because antidiuretic hormone, one of the effects is to squeeze down blood vessels, and the other effect is uh, to cause an increase in volume. So it makes sense, you know, in situations where you have sympathetic drive, you're bleeding out. Um, that you would want to get antidiuretic hormone on board, so to speak. You would consult antidiuretic hormone. All right, so that syndrome of an inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, um, the treatment for euvolemic hyponatremia, uh, regardless of whether it's a low ADH or high ADH, is to restrict free water. All right, that makes sense. So even if there's a lot of ADH around, if you don't have free water around for it to work on, then it's not going to be able to absorb as much free water, and uh, the, as a consequence, the plasma will be less dilute, sodium will rise up appropriately. Alright, so we've got one more to go. That was euvolemic, um, and then hypervolemic. So your volume status assessment uh, basically supports, and uh, often your history will also support, that your patient has one of these edematous states. So fluid is increased in the body overall, but it's not in the right place. It's not in the right place. Um, and so renal perfusion is down, renal angiotensin aldosterone system is up, and as we just mentioned, ADH will be high when you have sympathetic drive. So again, first step after we determine volume status, assess renal function. You can do that with the pheno, the urine sodium, just like over he here in hypovolemic, and I'm doing it in this example with urine sodium, um, but the fact to keep in mind here is that the kidneys should be peeing a dilute urine, all right? Again, if the sodium, if you're hypoosmolar, and you're, then uh, you should be peeing out dilute urine. So if the urine sodium is less than 20, that's exactly what the kidneys are doing. They're working fine. Look at that kidney. He's winking at you. He's got sodium. He's hanging on to it. He's not peeing it out, all right? So in that case, you know that the problem is either CHF or cirrhosis, all right? Because we've only got three edematous states to choose from. We've got kidney failure, heart failure, liver failure. So if the kidney's working fine, it's going to be heart failure or liver failure. Heart failure, the mechanism decreased renal perfusion. Cirrhosis, um, it's a little bit more complicated, uh, but you have hypoalbuminemia, so you have decreased intravascular volume, and then you have this splanchnic vasodilation because bacterial parts are not getting filtered by the liver and so there's an increase in nitric oxide and uh, blood vessels are not constricting and dilating in the places they're supposed to be. Uh, Splanchnic vessels are vasodilating more than they should. So the end result being that, like I said, let's keep it simple here, the fluid is up but not in the vessels that it needs to be, not in the right place, uh, so re renal angiotensin aldosterone system is increased. Um, all right, so that's your. These are your reasons for hyponatremia, and so you're going to treat the underlying cause, um, treat the cirrhosis, treat the CHF, and that'll help the hyponatremia get better. So Lasix, okay, 
Peene more H2O than salt. By the way, something I meant to mention over here in drugs, uh, you'll notice that I didn't put uh, Lasix, I didn't put um, loop diuretics here, and that's because loops screw up the countercurrent so much that actually um, they don't cause uh, they don't cause a, a free water to be peed out as much be by screwing up the countercurrent mechanism. What am I trying to say here? By screwing up the countercurrent mechanism um, in the kidney and uh, decreasing the concentration of sodium and the decreasing the osmolality in the medulla, uh, ADH is not as effective. All right, so it's more things that the weaker diuretics, aldosterone mechanisms, thiazide mechanisms that we're talking about over here at hypovolemic hyponatremia. Sorry, that was an aside, but something I did mean to mention. All right, so Lasix and then dialysis if we're in kidney failure over here. Um, then these are for liver failure, spironolactone, octreotide, um, midodrine, um, your your typical treatments for somebody in liver failure, you're trying to block this increase in renin angiotensin aldosterone system, and octreotide is the treatment for this um, splanchnic vasodilation, inappropriate splanchnic vasodilation. All right. Um, so now kidney should be peeing a dilute urine. If they're not, if the urine sodium is greater than twenty, oh snap! All right, the kidney is like, whoops, I'm losing sodium. WTH? All right. Uh, so why would you be doing this? Well, obviously, if you're in renal failure, kidney's not working. And then nephrotic syndrome is another one. All right, so I, you know, we could probably group this under renal failure, nephrotic syndrome, but um, one of many causes of renal failure. So, um, and that would be treated with dialysis. All right, so lots of different causes for hyponatremia, and lots of different treatments. I want to just t spend a couple minutes over here in general principles for treatment. Um, the uh, first thing being, you want to bring the sodium back up slowly, all right? No greater than 10 to 12 milliequivalents per day. Uh, close my parentheses there. Um, and the reason is, I'm sure you all know this, but I have to say it, is that when we have hyponatremia, as I mentioned, the reason that we have symptoms is that we have brain swelling, all right? And so, when we correct the hyponatremia, water moves out of the brain cells, and, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, water moves, water moves back out of the brain cells, um, because now we've corrected the hyponatremia, so the blood vessel is hypertonic, the sodium is back there. So water moves back out of the brain cells, and the swelling is undone. Well, the brain is very poorly adapted to rapid changes in, uh, tonicity, and so what you can get is... You know, you can get all these terrible things when the brain swells. You can get something that's uh, equally as terrible. Well, I don't know if it's equally as terrible as death, but some would argue it is. Central pontine myelinosis, okay? And this is basically these fluid shifts, for some unknown reason, cause uh, demyelination of white matter tracts. Uh, it can be most commonly in the pons, but it can be in uh, other areas as well. And so the the uh, most common symptom of this is quadriparesis that is rapidly developing. Uh, interestingly, this effect usually doesn't happen until a couple weeks after the hyponatremia is corrected. Um, so uh, this is just something to look out for. Um, s several clinicians have told me that if you believe you've corrected the hyponatremia too rapidly, um, you've overcorrected it, uh, you know, that day, that you can prevent this effect by kind of going backwards. So um, the brain adapts very slowly to changes in sodium and water concentration. So if you screw up and you realize it, that you overcorrected, you know, 7 o'clock at night and you started your correction at 7 in the morning and you're already up here, you can back off, you know, you can give the person uh, half normal saline and bring them back down. But um, this is very rare, but it's very feared because of this this quadriparesis, this is irreversible, so a terrible thing that to happen to somebody when you're trying to help them. Uh, so slowly correct, no greater than 10 to 12 milliequivalents per day. Treat the underlying cause, all right, give them fluids if they're dehydrated, treat their heart failure, treat their uh, liver failure, give them dialysis, their renal failure, etc. All right, um, and then uh, this is a, you know, I don't know about... The sodium, uh, sodium change.